if someone says, you know, how do you get good drum sounds? And they said, oh, it's, you know, it's pull ticks, it's EQ, it's Neves, it's APIs, it's a console, it's tape machines, you know, it's a studio, it's, you know, go to Sound City, go to Sunset Sound, Abbey Road, you know, um, microphones, uh, Fairchild's compressors, EMI compressors, the list can go on. But when you think about it, what makes good drum sounds is Ringo Starr, John Bonham, <laughs> Hunt Sales, Fee Thomas, and you could probably get away with one mic on them and that would be killer. But today we're going to talk about modern recording and getting a good drum sound. One myth that's kind of unspoken unless you've kind of dabbled in that world, if you look up on YouTube on drum sounds or if producers who get great drum sounds, there's a peep, there's people in town like the Drum Doctor, there's like two or three other cats in Los Angeles that you can call and you can say, hey, I want Metallica's black drum set sound. That guy has the full kit. I want Slipknot sound. Oh, got the Slipknot kit. You know, I want the Chili Peppers. Oh, they got four of those. What record? You know, you can, it's like dialing up food, steak, filet mignon, lobster. If you're vegan, you can get the vegan dinner. Well, drum sets are the same way. There's people that make a living supplying recording studios with the best drums on earth. If you happen to not know Dale from the Malvins and you aren't Dave Grohl, you can't borrow Dale's bell brass. You know, that's Nirvana right there. So do your best to arm yourself with things that you can really make a difference in a studio. Let's talk about the kick drum. Okay, this is a 26 kick drum. That's not for everyone, that's for sure. But in using this kick drum, I really had to make this thing adapt to my uses. That hole right there, initially it was a solid head. I love the way it sounded. It was like Tom Waits, John Bonham. But on the other side, the beater, that did not work out good for drummers. It's almost like a basketball being flated to optimum performance. It bounces really well. Well, that's the beater on the other side. If you deflate the basketball with making that hole in it symbolically, the beater won't bounce off. It's like bouncing a flat basketball you get a little bit more not so much resistance of the beater bouncing back drummers hated the no hole head so i compromised even though i know the sound wasn't exactly what i wanted i put the hole in it so then the variable of more drummers being able to use this kick drum totally improved and i got a lot more chances to use this kick drum because now when the beater hits it doesn't bounce back. And one of the biggest issues was not necessarily that it even bounced back, is I can't control what drummers do and how they play. Now, if I have the, if I didn't put a hole in the beater, there's two types of drummers. There's a drummer that hits and he keeps his foot on it. And there's a drummer that hits and he releases his foot between the beats. Because drummers are just muscle memory instincts, when I didn't have the hole, if I happen to have a drummer that hits and keeps the kick there, what it does is sometimes when he rests his foot, it'll vibrate. It'll like sound like a, uh, like a triplet. So it's a hit and then with a little bit of a triplet behind it. So by me cutting the hole, that released that from happening. So if you rest it, it's dead. Now you're probably going, what the hell is that? Do you have hamsters in there? I don't, but I do have newspapers shredded up. I'm not making a piñata <laughs> and I'm not making paper mache. The reason I have this is I was told this is an old jazz trick. Jazz drummers used to put this in there. Now, if you do get a kick drum, there are a zillion types of modern DW, whatever, like, you know, pillows that you can put, you can put a Pokemon in there, a pillow in there, it doesn't matter. I used shredded paper because I did a record with Dave Sardi. He had a kick drum that he traveled with in an anvil case. It was a 26 or a 24, I can't remember, filled with newspaper. Now, what are the benefits of using the newspaper? Well, if the drummer thinks it's too dead, you can reach in and pull out by the handful, almost in ounces, to dictate how dead you want this kick drum. I thought that was great. So I've actually just kept this amount of kick drum uh, paper in it 
because it sounds really good. So I don't mess with it. It's something I never worry about. So on the miking of those drums, I've talked about um, how I've done things in the video that I'll show part two of this. I'll show you what I used. I had a condenser that hung down right above the beater. It's called an SM98. And on the outside of the drum, I had a FET, like a FET 47, but it's a Bach 195. And then inside the hole, I had a Sennheiser 421 to capture the impact. All right, I just wanted to touch base with one more thing about we were talking about tuning the gun. So one of the ways I can find the tuning or achieve the tuning of the snare is I lower everything down where the head is basically useless. As I start to raise it up, I raise it up in increments. I go this one to this one, this one to the one directly across. As I move across the drums, you always start tuning it in a circle and using the counter nuts as well for tightening. Then I check the tuning. That is a D on acoustic guitar. So get that on. So that's a D. Me, 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 me. I did a session with Pete Thomas. I know I've talked about Pete. Pete is an incredible drummer. If you get a chance, watch Produce Like a Pro with Pete Thomas, and he runs down his drums. He talks a lot about his drum history. I don't know, we did film him talking about his tuning of his drums, but I don't know if that made the actual um, program. So Pete does this thing, or for, for instance, this drum, Try to see if I can get this close to. What is that? Okay, that looks like it's A on my acoustic. So this is tuned to A. Now, I remember when we said our snare was in D. This is tuned to A. Now, Pete, now I, I all the tension is right where it sounds really good. But what Pete did on his sessions, like um, Pump It Up by Elvis Costello, he did some records with um, John Paul Jones. If you look up John Paul Jones' solo record, incredible drum sounds. This is the way Pete does his drums, which is interesting. So I'm gonna lower these all down. Now as I've loosened these, I'm just putting the lug just back to where they start to grip the drum. Okay, so it's pretty much something out of a thrift store. Now what Pete did on his drums is he wants his drums to be struck and then he wants the sound to go like a dive. And he way did he loosen all the drums and he would only tighten two first. So I'm gonna, these ones, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six lugs. Let's count this as number one. I'm gonna tune the number one up. Two, three, four, the number four straight across from it. I'm gonna start to tune only these two lugs up. Sounds really good but he would want to dive. He wants it to go down. Just lower these a hair. You can barely hear the a dive so if I put gels on it there it is you can hear the note hit and then it dies so once again to recap how Pete does is he's a one of the most well recorded Los Angeles studio drummers is 
you loosen all the drum heads. You start to retighten just two of them, two out of the six. These ones come up into a tone you like, and then grab this one and start to bring it up. And as you bring it up, you bring it into tune, but that starts to add the note to dive. This is my drummer's Black Beauty. Probably one of the most well-recorded drums in the history of all drums. I mean, I don't know if Black Hole Sun was this, but it sounds like it. This is an incredible, real 80s Black Beauty. Now this drum, which is a 60s, is not as thick as the Black Beauty. When I was mentioning earlier about drum sizes, you can see the Black Beauty is way deeper than the snare. And I think that has a lot to do with maybe the sound as well. Now, I don't own this drum. This is my drummers. But I am thrilled that sometime I can use this. So this one literally was tuned by Hunt Sales. Okay, this is in C sharp. That being said, C, C sharp, D, this one, or maybe even B, rocking drum. That ring, that would be like you, if you were really, let's say you're an anal engineer, <laughs> and you're just like, oh my God, let's get that ring out of there. You're kind of blowing it. That ring is what you listen to like Black Hole Sun by Soundgarden, or you listen to John Bonham, and there's a ring, or even Audio Slave, there's a crack. That ring, which kind of is the ring of this drum, the actual drum, the heartbeat of this drum, is its ring. In rock and roll with heavy guitars, this is what you want. So if I tape this and take that ring out, then it becomes uh, no name. It just doesn't even matter what snare I use. But this Black Beauty with that little bit of a ring, if you can keep that, put some tape on it, it's going to be a winner. Uh, I also can play a little bit of that Hunt Sale stuff as well, that you can hear some of that snare. Two different types of drum sets. He tuned that, that drum completely to his. This last weekend drum kit that I'll play for you, I'll have a, it'll be a part two of this video. Um, I'll show you kind of what I was talking about the tuning and how that applied to the drums. Some earlier videos I've done have talked about dynamics, condensers, and tube mics. I'll give you a little bit of a sample set in, into what those sounded like when they're re being recorded. So I do think uh, we're talking about some care that you'll have to do as a producer or an engineer to make sure that when you're thrown into a situation with a drummer that doesn't have a good drum set, you can actually land on your feet and come out with something that's really great.